You're listening to The Heart of You on Paris Underground Radio. You are listening to Paris Underground Radio. My name is Annette Delu, and I am the host of The Heart of You. Today I am here with Lorraine Kahn. She is the owner of Feng Shui Tea. Her services include giving you the tools and the direction to be able to balance your energies, not only within your space, but within yourself through the practice of Feng Shui. Lorraine is an interior designer and a Feng Shui expert. She is here in Paris for the moment, but as of next week, is actually moving to Australia. She does in-person as well as online consultations. Lorraine, welcome to the show. I'm so happy that you're here. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Let's start off in the beginning. What is the history of Feng Shui? So first of all, it's important to understand what is Feng Shui. So Feng Shui is an ancient Chinese art of living that helps us energize our environment in order to provide harmony, more health and more prosperity into our lives. So it's an art that has more than 4,000 years old and was born in China. And for centuries, Feng Shui has been kept a secret from the Chinese ruling class. So it was used almost exclusively by the emperors. So the study and practice of Feng Shui were therefore not open to the public. So, you know, it's not too long ago that Feng Shui became to be well known, especially in our Western culture. So it was during, you know, the 60th century, uh, during the Cultural Revolution in China, you know, when Mao uh, became in the power, came to power and, uh, you know, decided to, uh, to execute or imprison all the people that had the knowledge or have wisdom. Oh, wow. So most of the... Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. So most of the great master, Feng Shui master, had to flee the country in cities such as uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan. And what is interesting is that those cities are today known as the Asian Tigers, which means they are the countries that are the most well developed in Asia. So is it because of Feng Shui? I don't know. You have to decide. But I think... <laughs> The idea is interesting because once they arrived in those cities, they helped build the infrastructure of the city according to Feng Shui rules. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. What a beautiful, rich history. So can you give us a broad overview of the different types of Feng Shui? So there's different schools. There's many schools of Feng Shui that exist. Um, the most renowned one are, you know, the traditional way of Feng Shui, the way they did it 4,000 years ago. But uh, since the 80th century, there's a more modern way of Feng Shui, which call, is called the Black Hat School. And this school was created in California in the 80s um, because uh, the um, Feng Shui teacher thought that traditional way of Feng Shui might be too complex for our Western mind to understand. So he made it much more easier, accessible and comprehensive to our Western mind. So the difference, the big difference between both schools is that in traditional Feng Shui, we align the space. So we use the direction, you know, north, southwest. Then we use time. So we have to study the astronomy, how the planets around us moves and how it affects us. And we also study the men. So astrology, what is their, you know, their essence? What is their karma? And how can we manage to align all of that in order to, help the man to go to from his karma to his dharma. So what he's supposed to do in this life. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but in more modern Feng Shui, we don't study time. We don't study astronomy. We only, you know, use what we call the, um, the compass to use the direction. And each direction, you know, is uh, it refers to a life category. For example, north is is related to our career, south to our reputation, southwest to the love. And in modern French, we only focus on that, how to activate those areas of your life, which I think it's it's interesting and, and, and work as well. I study both. So I have certificate in both school. I use both techniques, depending really on my client's personal beliefs and need. So I do my best to adapt the Feng Shui to my client's truth, because it's true that traditional way of Feng Shui can be very superstitious and it can 
be suffocating also uh, when we have to put all the remedies in the spaces. Um, so, you know, what I say to my clients is they know better than me. I'm just here to give the tools. If they feel, you know, it's not right for them to put, I don't know, like, for example, to paint the, the door in red or but mm. if it's too much, then I tell them, you know better. I don't want you to feel bad in your space. So so we then I, I, I try to adapt and use the more modern, easy way of doing feng shui. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm curious about feng shui as it pertains to somebody's location. Does it matter if they're in a different part of the country or a different continent? Does that have an impact on the type of feng shui that you will use? Of course, it has a huge, huge impact. So I do study traditional feng shui to try and understand where should that person live? Uh, and even, you know, where your house is f uh, in front of, you know, the south or the west, it will impact you. So what I, I do before each feng shui consultation is I do astrology of the person to know their chi. So what is their vital chi? So when you're mm. born, so we use your, your date of birth, the hour, the location, the first breath you take, the first inhalation is your first chi. So, and with chi, we can determine how, what is the elements that are favorable for you and the one that are less favorable for you. So um, with those, uh, with this uh, information, we can determine, okay, for that person, it's better for you to be nourished by fire. So fire, we're going to go to the south for you, or the south is going to nourish you more. Or if someone, I don't know, is more, okay, this person need metal in his life. He needs, you know, uh, active life. So metal is urban, urban cities, you know, so we're going to put that person more in urban cities. So it, it is important, the location. Yeah. And that can change depending on where somebody is in their spiritual journey, right? Absolutely. So we say when we do Feng Shui, uh, Feng Shui is only 30% of the work for a spiritual journey. So it's not that much. So what we say in Chinese metaphysics, in order to activate, you know, your luck in your life, uh, what you really want or desire. So it's what we call the law of attraction. There are steps <laughs> for that. So first of all, we need to work on the heaven luck. So this is 30% of the chance. The heaven luck is the destiny study. So what, as I said, what is your chi? What, what are the stars telling you about you? And then you have 33%, which is the earth luck. So this is the feng shui. So what city you're going to live in, as you said, what are the surroundings? You know, surrounding also means the people that are around you. Do they support you? And then you have 33% of human luck. So human luck is what you just said, is your willpower, is your journey, is your capacity to take action and to improve yourself. And uh, so, yeah, I will say that it will depend on your on your journey, your spiritual journey. Wow, that's really great. I'm already sold. <laughs> Sign me up for a consultation right now. <laughs> okay, so having the proper balance of chi in our spaces, how does it help us in our own personal energy in that respect? Of course, so chi, the definition of chi is really the vital life force that surrounds us and is directed through the wind and the water. So wind and water in Chinese is feng shui. <laughs> so that's why we call mm. it feng shui. So, and this energy uh, has different names in, diff in different cultures. So you call it prana and yoga, kundalini for the Sikh, rua for the Hebrew people. Well, it has many names. And this energy is really present in all living things. Our mission as a feng shui consultant is to provide proper balance of this energy, uh, the chi, which means that we have to make sure that this energy circulates freely in your space and is well balanced. So... There's different kind of energy, as you know, there's the yin and the yang. So yin, you know, in the Ayurveda and yogi is Shakti and um, in the, and the yang is the masculine, so it's Shiva. So our goal is really to harmonize those both energies and make sure it is fluid as, so that it dance, you know, it's like a joyful dance between those energies in your space. So how does it help us in our personal energy? Um, let's take the analogy of the micro ma macrocosm, you know, the metaphor like an entire ocean lies within a single drop of water. 
we, we said like, we need to have a healthy body in order for our cell to be healthy. So let's take that metaphor. So in order for us, us as a cell to be healthy, our house, which is the body, you know, the body is the house and you are the cell has to be healthy. So, so that's why the house has to have a healthy chi in order for us to be healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Great. And I think a lot of people, especially if you are living in a big city, oftentimes we end up living in a place where it's just a place we can afford or simply it's just what is available because especially in a city like Paris, it is notoriously difficult to find an apartment here. Mm. So it's kind of one of those situations where it's like you can kind of take what you can get. And if you're not thinking of those things ahead of time before you take an apartment or if you're not feeling into the energy, then it may not be the right place for you. Let's say somebody is in an existing house or apartment or they just purchased one or they just moved into one and they were not aware of the energies or they weren't even familiar with feng shui. Can you balance that space still? Can you make that place harmonious for them? That happens to me very often when clients, they heard Feng Shui after they bought their house. So what I say to my clients all the time is sometimes, you know, having the house is like finding the love of your life. Like you, you don't choose. <laughs> you don't choose. It's unconsciously you, you choose this place to work on yourself. And what is amazing, and it's the same in partnership, you know? Yeah. Like the person that you're going to attract is going to make you evolve and see, you know, your pattern. And so when you pick a house, the house is here to tell you what are your blockages, what are you, you have to work on yourself, you know? Mm. And yes, then when I do Feng Shui, I come and I tell them, okay, that's what you're going to experience this year. Because every year things change as well. Energies change. You know, as the planet never stay always there, like stuck in one place, they're always in movement. So energy always change. So we're never going to be stuck in a heavy energy if, if you're conscious about it and if you make the right remedies at the right time. You know, Feng Shui is a question of doing the right thing at the right moment at the right time, <laughs> you know. Right. So with Feng Shui, you know, you don't just move uh, things like that anytime. That's, that's the traditional way of Feng Shui. You have to move your bed at a particular time, hour of the day. No <laughs> so kidding. With Feng Shui, yeah, it's like you're changing your train, <laughs> you know. So sometimes you have to wait a whole year to change the train because it's too dangerous to shift the energy right immediately. Sometimes you can do it the next day. It really depends on the, the place in your house we're touching. Yeah, there have been times in my life when I've been in an apartment, let's say, and I started feeling like the energetics of the place were just not matching. And I kind of felt this need to to move or to change the environment in some way, maybe move some furniture. But like, yeah. then all of a sudden, you know, something like, you know, the landlord say, oh, we're selling the place and you need to move or something else happens where the energies are, are literally pushing you out of the place. Yeah. And, you know, likewise, during the pandemic, I think I rearranged my furniture. I'm not kidding. Like four times. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. exactly. Yeah. You know, and I think intrinsically, the energy is always speaking to you. But without the knowledge of Feng Shui and without a fabulous expert like yourself, <laughs> you might end up getting into a place where you're just arbitrarily moving furniture just because you know that the energy needs to change, but you're not necessarily doing it mindfully and in a way that's going to be improving the energy or making it change to work with you and with the flow of your chi exactly. as opposed to just randomly moving the furniture around. Exactly. But sometimes when you do things, you don't know, you just move the things and it is a disaster after, but you didn't know. Right. <laughs> uh, but but sometimes you have to experience this in life to grow. Yes. Sometimes it's necessary for you to experience this. So um, for me, Feng Shui happened at the right time in your life. Are you looking for a new book to read? Because I know I always am. Head to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio with your host, Jennifer Garrity, as she interviews 
fascinating authors that have a French connection. We will be right back with The Heart of You after a word from our sponsors. Welcome back to The Heart of You on Paris Underground Radio. You become wiser when you experience a lot of shit in your life. I don't know. <laughs> you, you feel wiser after. So sometimes you have to go through that. And then uh, when you know about Feng Shui, life becomes more harmonious. I, this is what happened for me. Huh? It was pretty messy my life before Feng Shui. Uh, and when I know Feng Shui, my life became a little bit more harmonious. Not all the time. I'm not saying Feng Shui is like the key to everything. As I said, Feng Shui is only 30% of the luck, luck chance, mm. but uh, it is much better. It helps you much more in your daily life. It's a support tool, right? Exactly. It's something yes. that can support you in your spiritual journey. So can you just go over with us your process of what you do when you see clients, how you start to assess the energy and figure out what the best direction is for them? Yeah, so first of all, we have a call so that I can detect the energy of the client and what kind of feng shui am I going to apply for that client. Then the first thing I do is that I ask their floor plan, I ask their address. We have very powerful tool today to really detect the right point cardinal, the right directions of the houses. And with, with Google Earth, all of that, I can see the environment of the place uh, pr very easily. So if I do online, that's why I'm going to work a whole day on their analysis, depending on the square meters uh, and the people, uh, how many people are living in that place. The first thing I do is, of course, I do the astrology of the person to know their chi and if it fits well with the place. Then I will go and analyze the exterior environment. So what kind of chi surrounds the house? You know, for example, do you have a good turtle we say um, at the back of your house so the turtle is the energy that's going to support you in your project do you have a good masculine and, and feminine energy that surrounds do we have a, a water energy in front of you yeah so there's a lot of analysis we have to do and all this analysis tells so much of what you're going to experience <laughs> during the period you're in that house and then what i do is that i look in the floor plan i see how the chi circulates in the floor plan with the furnitures and I make sure that there's no bad chi so sometimes there's bad chi so for example the bad chi is when you have like very um, shift angles um, pointed in you know, towards you your bed so that's really bad or when you know there's mirrors that are not placed correctly if mirrors for example, are in front of your bed that's really bad or if you have mirrors right in front of a door that's not good because the chi is bouncing, so the chi is not coming in fully. So there's there can be friction. Uh, so then I, you know a, a really deep analysis with what we call the bagua map, where I, I take my feng shui compass and make sure like energy is well placed. And then what I do is then I I ask the person to look at each object in their house and see if they feel good with that object because everything around you have energy. So you don't want to surround yourself with a, a, a piece of work or an art that drains your energy and sometimes we don't even notice that so take your time and look at each thing that is in your place and see if uh, it brings you more energy if it's neutral or if you know you don't feel good at all and then you have to remove that from your from, from your place and you are able to do this remotely for your clients correct yes like you can do this over a Zoom call or something? Yeah, it's a Zoom call and a presentation. So it's a Zoom. I do the whole presentation to them to explain exactly which area of the house they should do, what color they should put, what are the remedies for their houses. And then I, I send them a full report. So it's like a 30-page report so that everything I just said during the presentation is clearly on the report. Mm -hmm. And... When, because I'm traveling a lot, so it's hard for me to go to, in houses now. Yeah. Um, but then it's their job, you know, what I just said previously, to really look at each object and tell that, and if they feel good or not good, to remove it or to keep it. And oh, yeah, I forgot to mention, I also send um, the dates, the correct dates and hours to shift an object or, 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 or if it's possible 
today or this year to move the bed or not. How often do you recommend that people get this type of consultation? Is it once a year or is it once every few months or whenever they feel guided? Okay, so Feng Shui can be a great use during time of imbalance. So if you're moving, if you have a wedding or a divorce, or even if you want to start a business. So people can do Feng Shui anytime they want because it really helps reducing the stress, improve your sense of balance and helps support your health and prosperity. So as I said, in traditional Feng Shui, we recommend that you do a consultation every year because we study time and we study the planets that moves. And the big shift of energy happens during the 4th or the 5th of February. So it's during the Chinese New Year where we use the lunar calendar. So normally I have a lot, a lot of consultation during that time of the year. Right. (laughs) <laughs> so you know you know how one year is the year of the rat the next is the tiger and so on and this is an indicator that energies change every year so we have to make sure that the energy of the animal of the year is well adapted in your space so we make sure do we have to move some objects just to make sure it is well aligned with the planets um, so that, that would be the great time of the year to do a Feng Shui consultation. And would you be able to tell, let's say, if somebody goes to you for a consultation and let's say they've lived in a place for a little while, would you be able to tell right away through the Bagua chart that, hey, maybe it's time to make a change or move? Would you be able to tell something like that? I'm not able to tell you have to move like in a year. Not really. What I'm able to see from the Bagua is what they're go- what they are experiencing. What are the blockages? So no, I don't think I can tell people to move. I think they know more than me if it's time or not to move. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And especially if their energy is feeling more and more sort of harmonious with another place or they're feeling drawn to another place, depending where they are in their spiritual journey, then they can definitely do that. If they are in that space of deciding whether or not they should move into a different place, could they contact you in order to ask you, hey, I'm thinking about moving to this particular place. Is this aligned with me from a feng shui standpoint? Of course, of course. I also do um, astrology, like astrocartography. I study that as well. So what I do is that I see if the city match with their energetic potential. So before they move, maybe it's, it's a good thing to ask me if, or, or any other astrologer or feng shui consultant, to know if this place will be the right place. So it depends if you want to develop a business, if you want to find love or, or whatever. Some cities are more, are more favorable for those uh, kind of energy to enter someone's life. Right, absolutely. So it depends on the energetic match that you are to the place. Exactly, yes. I, it's like the house, the city. It's like finding love also. Yeah. <laughs> match. Okay, so... What kind of changes can somebody expect after they've gotten the report and they've done some of the things that you have advised them to do? What can they expect to feel energetically? Would things just sort of flow more smoothly? Manifestation is easier, things like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, totally. They will feel much more fluid, but they have to do the work. I mean, I'm going to tell them the remedies, the things to do at what time. And after that, normally... Most of the case, yeah, they can manifest much better. The energy is much fluid. They feel much, much better in the place. And sometimes they even think they're in a new place. (laughs) Yeah, but what I I saw from my consultation is that the people where really they have the change that, that came like within two days or three days are the people that are doing this work on themselves. Oh, beautiful. As I said before, it's only 30% the Feng Shui to work. And the people that didn't uh, work on themselves, you know, because some people just uh, buy Feng Shui consultation as as gifts Mm -hmm. and they don't know all of the energy thing. So it still occurs, but it takes more time. Yeah. 
It makes a lot of sense because one of the things that I work with is the balancing of masculine and feminine energies within a person during their spiritual awakening journey, right? So there are various different times in our spiritual journey where we're being asked to be more in our yin energy or our receiving energy. And there are other times when we're being asked to be more in our divine masculine energy or our yang energy. I imagine that with having the balance of chi in your space through feng shui, it would also support you in that practice of being able to access both the masculine and feminine energies when you are being called and when it's appropriate. Exactly, exactly. The, the goal of feng shui and even other practices such as, you know, tantra or whatever is, is to create the balance between the two, yin and yang. It's really that. And once you have the balance of them, so it's accepting your masculine as well as your feminine side, then it's easy for you to flow life with what kind of energy is better for me now? Okay, I, I, I can tap into the masculine energy. I can tap into the feminine energy. And the space will support you because energy is already harmoniously uh, balanced. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So another question that I have is in regards to other tools. We have had various different episodes on this podcast about crystals and other divination tools. So how does this practice work well and in tandem with other modalities that people might use to help themselves forward their spiritual awakening process? Yeah, so it's true that crystals are not a part of classic feng shui of ancient China. They didn't use that. But now that we have access to many beautiful crystals, semi-precious stones, uh, and other practices, why not take advantage of their powerful vibration to enhance our surroundings? So it, yeah, over time, Feng Shui has evolved and blends well with other esoteric practices. So the combination of lithotherapy, so the power of stone and Feng Shui, is great. And we can use crystals by associating them with a specific element. You know, in Feng Shui, we use the five elements. So there's one there's wood fire earth and metal so according to their colors and their virtue for example celestine is a the blue the blue uh, stone will represent the water elements and the communication so it will be best placed in the north area of your house because the north is about communication is the career is your life path is the journey the, the water so we're going to place this crystal to enhance this um, this area of your life in the north. For example, jade or aventurine or malachite is more of a wood energy. Uh, the rose quartz is earth energy, so will be associated with, you know, with love. So it's better to put this stone in the sector of the love house, which is the southwest of the house. So we do sell some, some crystals on, in our shop. We each crystal has their Feng Shui tip. So you will know where, where to place the crystal in your house. That is super helpful. I personally have a lot of crystals and I use them for various different things. And I do crystal grids and those sort of things. So knowing where to place a crystal grid and some sacred geometry okay. would be really helpful because currently right now I have a really huge flower of life on one of the walls of my living room. And I'm starting to wonder if I put it in the right place. <laughs> Anywhere is the right place you have to experience it. But with Feng Shui, the flower of life is better on the northeast of your house. The northeast represents the, um, the knowledge, the spiritual wisdom. What, what is interesting in Feng Shui is that we really see what you're going to experience in that apartment. And as I see, you do, you do podcasts about the spiritual awakening, uh, consciousness. And so it's not a surprise, actually, to that you tell me that this, um, this flower of life is on the, your north. <laughs> There's a reason why Paris is considered one of the most romantic places in the world. Lily Heisey of Romancing in Paris explores all of these little hidden places where you can experience the love and the romance of the City of Light. You can find Romancing in Paris at parisundergroundradio.com. We will be right back with the heart of you after a word from our sponsors. 
Welcome back to The Heart of You on Paris Underground Radio. How do you handle it when there is something in somebody's space that is definitely not working with the chi, but the person just loves, loves, loves this particular object or this piece of furniture? And you know from the chart that it either has to go or has to be moved somewhere. How do you handle that type of situation? For me, the person knows better than me. <laughs> I'm okay. Like, <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, of course, I tell them, okay, it's maybe not a good thing to have it there but if you you don't want to let it go then you have something to work on so maybe keep it there's something to work and there's and when that person will heal or i don't know from from himself then probably he will move or like he will decide to move that object to put it somewhere else so i i I suggest them solutions you take it you don't take it it's your free will after so that's what I say to them. I don't want to make Feng Shui, you know, something very rigid because most people that do traditional Feng Shui as well as modern are very rigid with the rules. Like don't do that, move that, or, or something bad is going to happen. I'm not into that, that philosophy at all. For me, I'm like, you, you do your experience, experience the thing, maybe put that away and see if your life is changing for the best or not. If not, put it back. You know, it's, it's about experiencing. That's such a beautiful way of putting it because so many times some of those fear-based energies can really almost infiltrate these beautiful sacred practices. And the fear-based comments or the fear-based thought forms are not necessary at all because as you're saying, it's all about the learning process and it's all about what you need to work through. So if something is stuck energy, well, maybe it's stuck for a reason and that is where you need to focus your attention to do that work before it can be released exactly exactly sometimes don't force don't force things to happen some things have to come naturally yeah but when you have the desire to evolve and get better things are going to unfold naturally uh, i believe would you mind giving our listeners three tips that they could do right now to improve the energy of their space yeah, so the first thing I always say to my client is to clean the house, get rid of the object, the pieces of art that no longer serves you. So what I, I ask the, my clients is to have five boxes. So one box you put to give, another is to keep, another is to throw, another is to recycle, and another box is to offer as a gift. So just uh, have a whole day, you know, doing that. Uh, that already is a lot of work of cleaning the energy that no longer serves you. And you will see a difference after that. Then the second um, advice will be about mirrors. Make sure you don't have any mirrors in front of any doors or any windows as well, because the energy will bounce back. And also no mirrors in front of the bed. I mean, you can have mirror in your room, but don't see yourself in the mirror once you're in the bed. Oh, interesting. And the third, and and my favorite, is to add some life in your house. So add colors, add plants, add really the things you love the most, and surround yourself by beauty. I think it's very important in order to enhance our energy because it will affect your subconscious mind in a very positive way. So, you know, like what is the really first thing you see when you wake up? What is the last thing you see will impact your mind. Mm, Beautiful. I have a question about scents. So anything that brings, I guess, aroma to your space. So any sort of perfumes, candles, air fresheners, anything like that. Does that have an effect on the chi as well? Oh, for sure. Yeah, you have to enhance your space with smells that you like. You know, feng shuality is feng shui and sensuality. Sensuality is the awakening of the senses. Like when you enter a space, you have to, you know, like your senses are activated for you to be at peace. So like for you to to uh, come back to the present moment. So for me, it's very important to have, you know, quality incense, quality candles uh, that will not impact too much your health because there are some candles you know they use chemicals that are not that good some incense can be very uh, um, too much smoke can not be good for your lungs so make sure to open your windows if you use you know indian incense for example 
yeah, make sure to choose the right aromatherapy. Yeah, and I think it's very important, all the scents. And, you know, you can put this different kind of scents, you know, in a more yin environment or a more yang environment. For example, for the room, you will put lavender because it's more soothing, it's calming, and it's a yin uh, more yin aspect um, for sense and for the young you can use you know citrus or or amber as well because it will activate the fire element and make your you know so we use aromatherapy we use all those kind of therapy as well in feng shui it match really well and likewise i imagine sound yes sound yes of course and one thing I love to do at around this time, usually right around the time where it starts getting warmer and the, the seasons start to change, I like to do just a really big deep clean in my house. So I will clean out all of my closets, open all the windows and get all the stale energy out of there. I put on some music and it puts me in a really great mood and you're just really able to get rid of some of that stuck energy. And I really love doing that in the spring. Uh, in the fall, maybe not so much. Occasionally I'll do it, um, but it's mostly in the spring. So my question to you is, how often do you do that sort of deep clean, that sort of energy clearing, For sure. all of those things to sort of get rid of that stuck energy? So normally we do that during the equinox time. Okay. So, you know, there's the equinox, so there's the, um, the spring one and the autumn one, mm -hmm. or you can also do it during solstice you know the summer solstice winter solstice because there's a shift of energy that's going on on, on the planet or so it's a good time to you know uh, do a little celebration is the cer the purification ceremony is that you know is that you get rid of all the energy that was stuck the previous uh, months before and uh, you invite a more uh, clean and beautiful energy you elevate the energy with a, a purification ceremony like you dance uh, you you light up all the incense um, uh, so yeah but after if you feel the need to do for example when there's like a breakup or like a divorce is happening or uh, something pretty violent happen in the house yeah it's a good time also to clear out uh, the energy so um, what I suggest is like wait or, or during the new moon or the full moon when there's also a shift of energy in the planet at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And that sort of aligns with what we were talking about in a previous podcast about the right time to do crystal grids and working with that manifestation energy and with the moon cycles and the equinoxes. It's always a really powerful time and a good time to do these mm. sort of practices. And if you are already paying attention to these cycles for your current practices of whatever you're doing, this is sort of an easy add-on yeah. to yes. what you're already doing. Yeah. So one last question that I have for you is regarding implementation. So I know it can be a little overwhelming for people, especially especially if they're starting a new modality like this. And it might be overwhelming to think about the prospect of buying all new furniture or making investments in the house, mm -hmm. or they're not in a place where they can make a, a lot of huge changes. How do you address that with the client if they are not either able to make a lot of big changes due to finances or if they're just not ready to make those big changes? Of course. So... I tell them is step by step, you know, you don't have to move everything all around all at once. Mm. There's very um, small remedies you can put, you know, just just putting, you know, for example, the candles in the right place or a plant in the right corner, really small changes. It doesn't have to be overwhelming all at once. Right. Take your time, stay present, you know, because... I don't like to create frustration. And it's true. It happens to me a lot after a consultation. There's so much information all at once that it's true that it can trigger our mind. Like, oh my God, that's why I'm experiencing that. I have to buy a new <laughs> bed. I have to buy a new sofa. And I'm like, no, chill out. Calm down. It's okay. You take your time. Um, and small steps, really small steps. Like go every day, for example, you go to a gua, a specific gua. So a specific category of your life. And just step by step, take maybe an hour per day, you know, to feng shui a little bit. Um, but peace and love, you know, <laughs> all along. Uh, don't have to to rush things. 
So it's a practice like many of these modalities where it's not something that you just set up and leave it. It is an ongoing practice. It is an ongoing practice. It's a beautiful, it's an art of living. You know, it's a way of how you behave as well. It's not just you move furniture. It's how you perceive things, how, you know, um, you put, feng shui, you put energy in in matter. Yeah. Dans la matière. (laughs) You know, this is, is feng shui. Uh, so you have to take your time, be patient with that practice, because if you rush things, then things things are going to not really be smooth after. So, Well, thank you so much, Lorraine, for joining me today. Thanks, it's been super, super helpful. And on a personal note, I actually can't wait to get my consultation with you and get started. Yeah, of course. So could you please share with everyone how they can get in touch with you so you can check uh, my work on feng dash quality and then you can look on the service i am proposing and all my services are here you can contact me via the the website so everything is explained there i also have a beautiful instagram page where i give very often feng shui tip so feng shui tips regularly uh, so it's a uh, feng dot quality on Instagram. And uh, for for a thank you note for listening to this podcast, I offer 20% off for you to explore Feng Shui and uh, for the services. So just uh, put um, on the message Feng Shui 20 um, and then you will have uh, 20% off for all the Feng Shui services. Oh, that is so generous. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I really um, think it's, a, it's such a great tool, Feng Shui and I'm really honored and happy to share this knowledge that uh, my master taught me. So I think it's great if people can experience uh, Feng Shui in their lives. Absolutely. I agree. I want to thank every single one of you for listening today. And I want to let you know that all of the information to get in touch with Lorraine is in the show notes. Again, you can reach her at her website at fengshuality.com which is f-e-n-g hyphen s-h-u-a-l-i-t-y dot com my name is Annette Delu, and you can reach me at infinitesoullove.com and on all social media Facebook, Instagram TikTok and YouTube at infinitesoullove1111 This episode of The Heart of You was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, please join us on Patreon.